So how was the sessions coming so far? It's all good? Yeah, I love Shubhra's session on talking about the potential of immersive metaverse. And, uh, you know, as you see, like from the static dot com era, we've been uh, moving to the interactive sessions. And then right now, we're talking about the immersive uh, digital experience of metaverse. So that evolution and the projection uh, for the next uh, decade, if you're talking about 2030, it's almost 13 trillion. So let, let's uh, talk about like, how do you feel about the uh, readiness for the next uh, stage of metaverse? Shall we start with, uh, oh, we don't have a mic here? And would you like to introduce yourself, Mukund, first? Yeah. Hey, uh, my name is Mukundan. I'm the principal solution architect for Digital Twins and uh, Omniverse from NVIDIA. So I've been working in this space for a little over 14 years, and that's a bit about me. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Shivang Desai, the co-founder and CEO at Big Things. And we're an artificial intelligence company focused on fashion and retail particularly around immersive experiences for the consumer. Uh, hi, my name is Anand. Uh, I am the founder of RX Series and the CEO of MetaLab Technologies. We are into building uh, blockchain games, especially towards the mobile end of the spectrum. Namaskaram, everyone. I'm Pankaj Raut. I'm co-founder of Arjuna Lens. We at Arjuna Lens make our own augmented and virtual reality hardware. Plus, we have a platform for learning and development within the metaverse space. Awesome. Uh, so, if you're, if you're looking at right now, today, we have 400 million, 400 million users. Uh, if you're talking about Gen Cs and Gen Alpha, they are living in metaverse, right? So, what do you feel like? How is your organization being ready for that? Um, so, again, the word metaverse was coined way back, and it came into practice probably two years back. But if you look at the, the maturity of each technology, which is being categorized as metaverse, starting with AR and VR, mm -hmm. it's been there for a little over a decade. Correct. It's gone through the various uh, uh, curves of learning, places where it has made a massive impact, especially in the uh, learning space. Absolutely. And also yeah. in uh, you know, auditing spaces where right. AR has made a big impact. Correct. And there have been some places where it has not been made an impact. Yeah. Now, while the technology is maturing, there is also the hardware, which is in parallel also maturing. Absolutely. Again, uh, the next big thing, what I would like to add upon is, there's a limitation when it comes to hardware. Because there is only so much horsepower that can fit within the hardware. Let's say a virtual reality headset, it's based on a CPU based, and you can only throw 50,000 polygons at it. But now what we are talking about is cloud rendering which means I can throw 50 billion poly count and still I can make it run in an Android device like an Oculus Quest 2. Correct. Seamlessly. I can have a, a natural language conversation with a, a game avatar which Correct. doesn't have a person behind it. And all of this is happening because of the power of AI. Correct. So AI is going hand in hand with immersive tech. So what has been happening so far is world building space and then on top of it, you have a, a human-led uh, human interaction. Now it's completely transformed into an AI-driven interaction. Yes. Yeah. That's a bit I wanted to add. Yeah, yeah to, to complete this immersive experience today here, like Mike, the CEO of 3DM, who was supposed to join us, but he couldn't come. So, you know, you should have brought him as a hologram here. And so <laughs> that would have been a good experience. What about you? So, you know, how do you feel like, you know, what we are preparing for this experience of 400 million users today on the metaverse? I feel there's a lot of people out there that want to use this, but they're confused about which channels to take. Gaming right now is one of the biggest ones as yes. an entrant for people to start using it. But as it filters out into other industries, um, we, we work in retail and we see a lot of people beginning to adopt but there's still a lot of uncertainty around yes. it. And this is where we need to start bringing down those barriers that are causing the uncertainty. Particularly on the last panel, there was, uh, uh, there was a panelist speaking about data and ownership of that data. 
and people need to get comfortable with the ownership of their data being in their own control. And as this happens, and as the masses get educated about this, we will begin to see this mass adoption of 400 million people actually fully immersed and engaged in the metaverse. Absolutely, yeah. Data ownership and self-sovereign IDs are the thing to come, uh, you know, to evolve. What about you, Anand, the gaming king? Uh, I agree with Mukund. Metaverse is a fairly new word which has been floating around for the yeah. last maybe three years post-COVID. But as individual pieces of technologies, these have been there for the last eight years from the day Oculus or uh, the, even before Oculus what was bought over by Facebook. There was a company called Oculus and they were already into this. Right. So why Metaverse suddenly, uh, you know, is, is like everywhere is because probably of COVID one, and uh, number two, because of the ownership which you can have on the digital, app, digital things which you are in the web, and, and the decentralization, of course. So, and the numbers which you're talking about, the trillions of numbers, is mostly geared towards the ownership on the transactions which, which happens through that, by yeah. selling and transacting. And uh, yeah, the use cases are, uh, I don't know, 100, 200, 300, but last year was mostly about uh, digital arts, like you, like 2000, 2001, 2002 fairly, was about anything NFTs was selling. Now people are asking questions on why should I buy this NFT? On and above, it's looking great, it's a good art and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I'm a part of a community, but why should I buy this? What does it give me more than it being a collectible? Right. So the use cases have to address, or the companies and the projects have to address that. Uh, and then I think we are on the road to reaching those numbers which are being floated around. Yeah. When we started Asana Lens, uh, we had only one simple vision that we want to create impact on society using technology as a medium. So after that words like AR, VR, Metaverse, everything came in. Uh, it's very good to have them for marketing and for a buzzword to yeah. get traction. But the real impact is what should be calculated and that is where we have been focusing on. At Asna Lens, where we have deployed it is in Karnataka itself, wherein 18,000 individuals come onto the platform and learn vocational skills such as spray painting and welding. So these people are people that have come from very, very tough background. People who have just 7th pass, 8th pass, having a really bad home situation, no one is earning at their home. How can we use technology to, one, help them become really, really proficient, so proficient that they can take part into world skill competitions, right? right? We make them qualified so much. Secondly is help them learn fast, learn accurately and get jobs faster, right? So that is where I think the technology should move. Yes. Uh, although we should use all these words for marketing which will help build that traction, but this is where I think one of the biggest use cases lies is skilling the learning and development within the metaverse space. That's right, yeah. So, you know, as we were preparing for the Metaverse Fashion Week with my upcoming brand and with Future, so the question I had when I was working with Akshay and 3DM was like, will my avatar, which is in one new metaverse, like, will it work on the other metaverses, right? Because we are talking about a multiverse or an omniverse at this point. Uh, so I think the main thing which is coming up is interoperability. So what is your uh, take on like how, 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 how do we enha enhance the interoperability between verses? So again, uh, in the current scenario, right, most of these uh, M platforms or metaverse platforms, they work in a, a walled garden setup, which means they don't want to share the user data with anybody else. Correct. But now if you see there are already some great players who are trying to bifurcate the entire ecosystem where you create one avatar and you can use that as the avatar for shopping in Flipkart, or you can use the same avatar to go and uh, you know, visit a hospital clinic in a world. Right. But this is again a large move, and this requires open-mindedness from all, all customers, right? So there needs to be acceptance from the- uh, When you say customers, did you mean the metaverse I mean the, or uh, the, the people? The companies, the companies, right? Yes. So it's, yes. it's about exposing the, the client data. It, it's more like the thought, they're not exposing the data. It's more likely the common avatar which is going to come across the ecosystem. Correct. But it is the company who has to go and sign off saying it's okay 
to let another avatar ecosystem onto my brand. Correct. Yeah. A quick example here is NVIDIA as a company, we are building an avatar cloud engine, which Correct. is completely interoperable. Yes. And the motive here is to completely decentralize the avatar ecosystem itself. With one avatar, I can represent a complete virtual version of myself. It can look exactly like me. Yes. yes. With the right di uh, dimensions. So I can use that avatar to go and shop online. Mm -hmm. I don't need to again go and supply my shoulder size or my waist size or any of it. It will be an exact replica of myself. Absolutely, and, uh, yeah. Um, if I would want to attend a conference, I can go and sh dress myself as a, you know, a, a, like in a formal suite, and right. then I can go and attend. And if it's for a party, right. I can go and look the hip way. Right. And all of this is feasible if we could all bring it all under one umbrella and then build on top of it. Absolutely. So I see Mike there. Mike, we were expecting you on a hologram to be in this Bangalore conference space. <laughs> we cannot hear you, Mike. One, two, can you hear me well? Yes, okay? yes. So I was great, saying great. we were expecting you as a hologram here. <laughs> um, mentally, I'm there as a hologram. <laughs> Physically, <laughs> we're not there yet as, uh, <laughs> as a humanity, but we're going to get there. Yes. Uh, as I hear from Omniverse and NVIDIA yes. and their strategy ahead. <laughs> so, Mike, we're, we're talking about interoperability and, like, you know, when there's, like, multiverses, uh, how do we promote more interoperability between, uh, uh, you know, the avatars moving around between verses and all that? So, would you like to add something to that? Well, first of all, uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, I would have loved to be there physically, but... Uh, <laughs> Everything that's happening in the world just makes it impossible right now. Um, but uh, it's, it's exciting to be there and, 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 and be able to share my 50 of advice with this great panel. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to be a bit more, um, you know, uh, open-minded in my response in this uh, question. Uh, as I don't, I'm not really a huge advocate of interoperability. Um, I'm a more, uh, I'm a bigger advocate of uh, omni-parability. And what I mean by that is that I do not think and I don't feel that is correct um, or has a prudent uh, business strategy to talking about having one avatar and taking it everywhere. I am, however, um, uh, and I, I am more bullish in the fact that there's going to be a multiple of different, um, you know, avatars or even like digital twins that can omni operate and uh, across different worlds across different channels and what i mean by that is that blockchain is just going to allow you to gather same utility or same form of data into different worlds into different digital twins across different um, uh, uh, channels not necessarily having to using the same asset but at least transferring the same kind of data ownership and data information across the different worlds and i think that is a much bigger bet and a much more realistic bet into trying to uh, consolidate basically the experiences across multiple environments mm -hmm. and being able to um, to create a much more realistic notion of giving a user the same providence the same power across different experiences um, rather than just trying to solve this question of interoperability of taking one asset everywhere because in reality, it's not going to work, and you have to have a lot of good faith, a lot of uh, parties working together with a common cause, which is not usually the case. And there's a lot of competition, as much as we like to try and be romantic about it. So um, we should always be rethinking from a different perspective. Agree, agree. What about you? What do you feel about the interoperability? So one is that, thank you for describing our business model, hyper-realistic avatars that have your shoulder <laughs> yes. size, your, your looks, and, and then you can try it on in shopping. Now, we do hyper-realistic avatars, but so does Mike, and so does Ready Player. Uh, now, Mike uh, does different kinds of avatars. Ready Player Me does different kinds of avatars. There are stylized avatars, realistic avatars. They're, when you come down to the technology, they all behave very differently. Yes, at their core, they move, they animate, Mm -hmm. But uh, beyond that, the avatars that you use for shopping are a lot more complex because they're designed to take your body shapes. Yes. But whereas the avatars that you use for gaming, you may not want to see yourself as a hyper-realistic avatar in games, and we, we actually see that a lot. Yes. People want to play as stylized avatars of themselves, and they want to go wild in games. So this is where the difference is. Interoperability 
a, as a concept, as a singular concept, may not actually work out in the way that, uh, much the way that Mike was also talking about. But we can see omnioperability. And that is also what we uh, believe is going to happen, where you have different systems and different companies that supply it, but across the same use cases. So you have the metaverses, you've got Meta and Sandbox and Decentraland and Roblox and Fortnite. All of their avatars look very, very different from each Absolutely, other. Absolutely. And yeah. all of them perform very differently. And the idea with interoperability in this case is to be able to use your own data as a user, but fit into the systems mm -hmm. that these metaverses have created for themselves so that users are the most comfortable in yes. those environments. Yes. Uh, so we are talking about interoperability in two segments here. One is interoperability of assets, yes. which, is, which are your avatars or anything for that matter. And two, interoperability of NFTs, which are your ownerships, right? So we are also talking about decentralization of applications, of uh, social media platforms and uh, uh, you know, whatnot, and games. Now, the larger scenario is we are selling NFTs, uh, giving NFTs for free, we are selling digital avatars, everyone is doing that. Now imagine if I'm asked to buy an NFT to access a platform. Yes. And then that platform tells me, okay, you pay me this much, you can access our platform, tokens, all that, etc., etc. Now there is another similar platform which is equally good. And they are also telling me, you also need to buy an NFT for you to access our platform. So how does this work out for a customer if there is no Correct. interoperability? Yeah. So, but I think it has to start with NFTs, which, is, which are ownerships in its first case. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, roadblocks for that. The backend system has to support that. But any, NFTs are basically you're fetching your data, your own data from the ledger, right? right. So I think inter interoperability will first start with related businesses who operate on a similar backend. Yeah. Example, if I am building a game where there is a uh, assume it's FPS, where the game screen is not going to show the avatar, but only the hands and the gun, right? So I can work with similar games because the animation is going to be shooting. Yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm not going required to show the full avatar because the game is designed such. Right. So I will collaborate with similar games who are building FPS for that matter. I will, I will open up my token ID to them and mm -hmm. vice versa. And I'll ask them, was you integrate or you make my NFTs log in through your game, open it for us, and I will also do that to you. Thank you. So yeah. I think this is where the interoperability in its base will start. And if there is a game which has cars, if a car races, which are mm -hmm. popular mm -hmm. games, so again, NFTs as cars, then you can easily pull up your car from, and of course the metadata has to support that, because you, right. you play and you upgrade your metadata, and you, you sort of create value through that, and you sell it in the secondary market. That's the use case, at least. Uh, that's the pitch which we are presenting to the customer. So then he should be, with one NFT, he should be able to log in into multiple games, multiple ap applications, fashion, whatever it is. But the core idea is one NFT and log in to at least similar applications so that it has more value for the money which they are spending on the... Yeah, agree. I think there will be two ways. One is you have an Android ecosystem and then the OS, iOS. So within metaverses as well, there will be Android ecosystems wherein it's more interoperable with multiple other things, it's more open. While then there are some companies that will have metaverses, even their assets which are not interoperable for multiple reasons in terms of speed, privacy, for whatever reasons they would have that as well. So I think going forward we'll have two kinds of companies, some companies which do not consciously go interoperable and some companies which do. Uh, for us, it's better as consumers to have more interoperability. For that, we can do two things. One is discuss more on forums like this. So at, within yeah. human consciousness, we are talking about interoperability a lot more. And second is have consortiums, which within the US is currently happening, wherein there are more consortiums trying to bring the same formats, same APIs, same protocol, so that the interoperability becomes better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, how many of us, like, consider Metaverse to be a real world? Any, any of us hand, please? 
No? So, yeah, yeah. So if you talk to Gen Cs or Gen Alphas, they're like, you know, are you living in, are you always in the virtual world? Like, you know, is it real? So for them, like, it is real. There is, like, a very fine difference between a real versus the reality, right? So for them, even the metaverse is the reality for them. Uh, so, but, you know, if, if I am spending time on with the uh, Oculus, I feel like, you know, I cannot be there more than one hour because of that hardware limitations. So what do you feel like in the gadget industry or the hardware industry? So starting with Mike, like how do you feel, the, what are the advancements needed in the uh, gadget industry and uh, how do you add more uh, ease, comfort, and real, realism to the uh, environment? It's, it's an excellent question. Um, and this is actually what's gonna shape and dictate the speed of acceleration and adoption in this new internet era. Yeah. Um, now, the most important thing to denote is the fact that sales for VR headsets are slowing down by a lot, yes. even more than what was initially predicted. This could be either because they didn't manage to bring down the, the price sensitive inflection point that will get consumers much more interested to buy them, or because in fact that a lot of people that buy headsets don't tend to spend that much time, as you mentioned, Hena, uh, within those environments yes. also because of different reasons either because of um, e epileptic issues or because um, there's nothing too exciting that can get them there for too long you know yeah, yeah. now what is interesting though is that you see the big boys like uh, apple uh, like facebook we were in davos in january and we were talking with the head of innovations of, of, of meta and he asked us where do you think that meta is investing more right now yeah. And we're like, I don't know, data? Or, well, I don't know. I just said a stupid question, just answer just to see what he was going to say. But he told us, well, actually on, on silicon gel, because they know that they cannot build phones, right? Where phones is like the, the immediate extension of our, of our hands. So they cannot go and compete against Apple, but they can go and compete against uh, glasses and lenses. So by building silicon gels, which is ultimately the lightest version of a hardware that you can better on a human um, right now without causing extra discomfort in their everyday movements and being able to penetrate through the lenses into a mixed reality environment, then they straight away go and compete against a whole new world of, of hardware that can be an extension of your physical uh, uh, lifestyle. Yeah. Um, and, and I think with the upcoming uh, World Development Conference from Apple, uh, we're also going to be seeing them unveiling their new uh, lenses. And, and that industry is going to be a huge unlock of what is about to follow. So anyone that is now in immersive content generation, anyone that is now investing heavily in avatars in mixed reality, they still haven't even reached the tip of the iceberg of what is about to follow once these things are about to be unveiled in the world and once consumers are going to be uh, massively uh, in rush to go and buy them. Um, I'm not saying they're going to replace phones entirely. It could be yeah. the day that that thing arrives, just like mobile devices replace desktop devices eventually. Um, but um, I, I strongly think that mixed reality will be the major driver into this new on-ramp of the new internet and new consumer behaviors that are going to lead the way in gaming, in, in commerce, uh, even in, in, in socializing. That's a great point. Anybody else would like to add on the hardware? Uh, yes, I think the major breakthrough in uh, this metaverse or whatever we want to call it is when we have the digital assets, uh, anchored on real world assets. Right. Like if, if someone wants to know what this panel is about, they should just pop up their phone, look at uh, the, the, the wall or whatever the in front of us without a QR code. Or imagine walking through a, a sort of a, a shopping mall and just yeah. taking up your mobile to look at a particular asset, a coat or a shirt or whatever it is, and your digital interpretation comes near to that. So when your, your information is anchored on the real world, and when that is accessible to you in a, in a, in a mobile, and that metaverse is, is being built by companies like Niantic and other companies, but I think a real commerce will happen and a lot of traction will happen then. Instead of going to, going to your browser or going to your application to look at what this product is about when you're actually standing there. 
agree. Agree. Mugund, you wanted to add something yeah, real quick? Uh, and just a couple of points. Uh, one is purely, I agree with the form factor. It's pretty big and uh, if you wear it for more than an hour, you kind of feel uneasy. Yes. So there is a lot of research already happening and bringing it down to as close to a, a eye spectacle, mm -hmm. a linear eye spectacles. That's the area where one uh, research is happening. And second one is the devices are lacking a lot of horsepower. So yes. Which means when you're going to throw a lot of AI at it, especially when you're running a, a powerful uh, AI inferencing, which means the device doesn't have the right hardware. So there are research happening in putting an SOC, mm -hmm. which is purely for running AI inferences, which yeah. means even if I am in the like 100, uh, 100 kilometers away from network zones, mm -hmm. or even if I'm deep down in a mine, while I'm the, the workman who is trying to take some decisions, so the, these devices, which has an SOC, will be able to run the inferences and take the decision for you. Yes. And it doesn't need to be connected to the internet. Yes. So these are some areas where there is a, a lot of progress happening as well. One minute to each. <laughs> okay, I'll keep it quick. Uh, one of the things that have not been highlighted is touch and feel. Yes. So there are five senses uh, that, that we utilize, but within the current scope of things, we are only using sight and sound. So we actually are partnering with some companies that are working in haptics, which deliver wow. the sensation of touch and feel, which is crucial to experiences because even when you're, when you're doing skilling or you're working with hard goods, it's, it's extremely important what the texture totally of the surface agree. is and how much pressure you're applying to it. So these are parts that are less addressed right now, but need to... Uh, Even for fashion add, industry, the texture and feel, yeah. It's, it's, it's ultra important because... That's a great point. So as a company, we make hardware. So that's one of the goals to make them lighter, more user-friendly and others. How we are doing that is we are trying to move computing as much into cloud as compared to on the device, which helps us reduce a lot more. Thus working on the optics up part of it. Optics is one thing which takes a lot of space within the device. So once there are more and more innovations within this spectrum, you'll see more and more lightweight as very similar to the glares that you wear today. So you'll be able to see that probably in a couple of years. Absolutely. What a great panel we had. Uh, thank you all so much. And Mike, next time you should be on hologram, work on it right now. <laughs> so thank you all so I'm much. I'm expecting for big, big, big things to be able to deliver that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all thank so you. much thank for you being so here. Much.